In the story, there's a kid who loves playing pranks. He's always coming up with funny jokes to make his friends and teachers laugh. He tapes pencils to desks, signs teachers up for silly websites, and does all sorts of playful tricks. Most of the time, it's just harmless fun. However, sometimes his pranks go a little too far. Like the time in middle school when he read online that eye drops could cause diarrhea. Thinking it would be a hilarious prank, he decided to sneak into his homeroom and put eye drops in his teacher's coffee mug. He thought everyone would find it funny. The day of the prank, he managed to put the eye drops in the coffee without anyone seeing. He sat in class, waiting for the prank to unfold, but nothing happened at first. He started to worry that maybe the information about eye drops was wrong. But then suddenly, his teacher turned pale and fainted. The classroom erupted into chaos, with students crying and running around. The prankster was terrified, thinking he had hurt his teacher badly. He ran to the nurse's office, scared that he was in big trouble. Fortunately, it turned out that his teacher had only fainted. The teacher had a terrible fear of throwing up, and the discomfort from the eye drops made him pass out. As for the diarrhea part, let's just say the classroom had a bit of a smell after that day. The point of telling this story is not just to show how mischievous the kid was in middle school. It's to introduce another prank story, one with even crazier consequences, where he actually was in the right. The perfect prank, according to him, is one that targets someone who deserves a bit of justice. In his sophomore year of high school, the prankster met someone who fit this description perfectly. His name was Mr. Miller, and he was the new geometry teacher. On the first day of sophomore year, the prankster was excited to meet this new teacher. He had heard that Mr. Miller was recently hired, and nobody knew much about him. To the prankster, this sounded like an opportunity for some fun. Maybe the teacher was young and impressive, someone he could show off his mischievous skills to. But as it turns out, Mr. Miller was not the kind of teacher anyone would want to prank for fun. He was strict and unkind, the kind of teacher who makes school a little less enjoyable. The prankster soon realized that his usual playful pranks wouldn't be enough for someone like Mr. Miller. He needed to come up with something bigger, a prank that would really make a statum. It'd be a bit too strict for his own good. I mean, I know I'm not the most well-behaved student, but even I think this guy is over the top. The principal raised his eyebrows, intrigued. Tell me more about this new teacher, Mr. Miller. What exactly happened in his class? Well, I began trying to recall every detail. As soon as I walked into his classroom, I knew something was off. The whole class was dead silent, and everyone was just staring ahead. There was this list of rules on the whiteboard. And I mean a long list. Rule after rule about no talking, no eating, no leaving your seat. It was like a prison not a classroom. The principal leaned back in his chair, listening intently. Go on. So I thought maybe he was just trying to scare us on the first day, you know? But then, I made the mistake of asking a question. I just wanted to know what would happen if someone was absent for a quiz. And he went off on me. He called me thick-skulled, and then gave me zeros for the first six quizzes as punishment, just for asking a question. Principal Nelson frowned. That does seem excessive. I appreciate you bringing this to my attention. I'll have a talk with Mr. Miller about his classroom management style. It's important to maintain discipline, but we don't want to create an environment of fear. Feeling a bit relieved, I thanked the principal and left his office. As I walked down the hallway, I couldn't help but feel a little triumphant. Maybe this was the beginning of the end for Mr. Miller's reign of terror. For the next few days, I noticed a slight change in Mr. Miller's attitude. He seemed a bit more restrained, though still quite strict. It was clear that the principal had spoken to him, but it wasn't enough. Mr. Miller was still the same old tyrant, just slightly less vocal about it. That's when I realized I needed to do something more to shake things up. It was time for a prank, but not just any prank. This one had to be big, something that would really get Mr. Miller's attention and show him he couldn't just bully his students. I began to brainstorm ideas, looking for the perfect way to execute my plan. It had to be something that wouldn't get me into too much trouble, but would still make a statement. After several days of thinking, I finally came up with the perfect idea. The next day in geometry class, I put my plan into action.
just before the bell rang, I snuck a small Bluetooth speaker into the classroom and hid it behind the whiteboard. I had recorded a funny sound effect that would play at random intervals throughout the class. It was harmless, but it would definitely disrupt Mr. Miller's lesson. As class began, everything seemed normal. Mr. Miller started his lecture, and then the sound went off. A loud, comical boing echoed through the room. The class erupted in laughter, and even Mr. Miller looked startled. He tried to continue, but every few minutes, the sound would go off again, each time causing more laughter. Mr. Miller was getting frustrated, but he couldn't find the source of the sound. He even started checking students' bags, but of course, he found nothing. The class was enjoying every moment of it, and for the first time, it felt like we had the upper hand. As the bell rang and we all filed out of the classroom, I could see the confusion and annoyance on Mr. Miller's face. It was a small victory, but it felt significant. For once, Mr. Miller was the one who had been pranked, and it showed him that he couldn't just push us around without any consequences. His eyes were like fire, burning with rage. Give me that phone, he yelled, reaching out for my old iPhone. I held the phone just out of his reach, continuing to record. My heart was pounding in my chest, but I knew I had to see this through. This was the moment where everything could change. With a swift movement, Mr. Miller snatched the phone from my hand. His grip was so strong that I could hear the plastic casing creak. In one fluid motion, he hurled the phone across the room. It smashed against the wall with a loud crack and fell to the floor in pieces. The classroom was silent for a moment, everyone in shock at what had just happened. Mr. Miller stood there, chest heaving, looking around at the stunned faces of his students. I couldn't believe it. He had just destroyed my phone. I knew it was an old one, but it was still mine, and he had no right to break it. But then, I remembered my friend was still recording with my real phone. This was the evidence we needed. Mr. Miller had lost control, and now we had proof. I stood up, trying to keep my voice steady. Mr. Miller, you can't just break a student's property. That's illegal. He glared at me, but I could see a hint of fear in his eyes. He knew he had gone too far. The rest of the class period was a blur. Mr. Miller tried to regain control, but the damage was done. The students were whispering and glancing at the broken foam on the floor. The atmosphere in the room had changed. After class, I rushed to the principal's office, my friend with the recording in tow. We showed Principal Nelson the video, and his expression changed from skeptical to horrified. I can't believe this, he said, shaking his head. I'll deal with Mr. Miller immediately. The next day, Mr. Miller was gone. We heard he had been suspended pending an investigation. The whole school was buzzing with the news. The tyrant geometry teacher had finally been stopped, but that wasn't the end of it. A few days later, my parents received a call from the school. They wanted to meet to discuss compensation for the broken phone. It turned out that Mr. Miller had been forced to resign, and part of the agreement was that he would pay for the damage he had caused. At that meeting, Principal Nelson apologized to me and my parents. He admitted he had been wrong about Mr. Miller and thanked me for bringing the issue to light. As for me, I learned a valuable lesson. Sometimes, standing up to authority is necessary, but it has to be done the right way. My mischievous nature had finally served a good purpose. I had helped rid the school of a bad teacher, and in doing so, I had grown a bit myself. From then on, I used my pranking skills for good, never to harm or disrespect. I realized that with a little creativity and courage, I could make a difference in a positive way. The school year continued, and we got a new geometry teacher. She was kind and fair, and the atmosphere in the classroom completely changed. We were finally able to learn and enjoy the subject. I sometimes think back to that day, when I decided to stand up to Mr. Miller. It was a turning point for me. I realized that even a high school student could make a difference. It wasn't about being the class clown or the troublemaker. It was about standing up for what was right and fair. And so the school year went on, but the story of Mr. Miller and the broken phone lived on in the halls of the school. It was a reminder that even in the face of strict and unfair authority, change was possible. It was a story of a student who stood up, a teacher who learned a lesson, 
and a school that became a better place for everyone. In a bustling, major metropolitan city, full of life and diverse neighborhoods, some parts were known for their beauty and affluence, while others bore the marks of neglect and decay. It was in one of these less fortunate areas that my story unfolds, a tale of courage, justice, and the power of standing up for what's right. I had recently moved into a house in this neighborhood, drawn by the affordable rent and the promise of a lively, diverse community. The house, a seemingly quaint two-story building, was converted into a living space with multiple bedrooms, rented out to different tenants. At first glance, the place seemed like a typical, if somewhat rundown, rental property. But soon, the cracks began to show. As I settled into my new home, I started noticing things that seemed off. The more I observed, the more my concern grew. Safety seemed to be a secondary thought in this house. The most glaring issue was the lack of smoke detectors in common areas and bedrooms. This was a basic safety feature that was non-negotiable, yet it was missing. I voiced my concerns to the landlord, a woman who seemed more interested in collecting rent than ensuring the safety of her tenants. Her responses were always the same empty promises of repairs that never materialized. Not one to give up easily, I pressed on with my complaints. Another issue that bothered me was the porch lights. They didn't work, and coming home to a dark, unwelcoming house was not only unpleasant but unsafe. Again, I was met with promises that were never kept. Frustrated and feeling ignored, I decided to take a more aggressive stance. I withheld my rent, hoping it would prompt some action from the landlord. Her response was far from understanding. She accused me of overreacting and challenged me to do what I needed to do. So, I did. I called the city's inspection services, hoping they would see what I saw and force the necessary changes. An inspector arrived and immediately began pointing out numerous safety issues and building code violations. It turned out the landlord had converted the house into a multi-tenant dwelling without proper permits completely disregarding safety and legal regulations. The inspector's visit stirred the pot. My landlord, furious about my actions, began a campaign of harassment against me. She took away my parking spot, turned other tenants against me, and inundated me with false accusations and eviction notices. Life in the house became unbearable. I couldn't step into the common areas without being harassed, and the stress was taking its toll but I stood my ground. The city's report came in, listing over a dozen violations, some of which posed serious risks. The house, which the landlord had been profiting from handsomely, was a ticking time bomb of hazards. The landlord was ordered to make extensive repairs, and the cost was substantial. Throughout this ordeal, I faced backlash from some of my roommates. They couldn't understand why I had taken such drastic measures. They saw me as the troublemaker, not realizing that I was fighting for our collective safety. It was a lonely battle, but I knew it was the right thing to do. The repairs began, and slowly but surely, the house transformed. Smoke detectors were installed, stair railings were fixed, porch lights were repaired, and a carbon monoxide alarm was added. The balcony, which had dangerously lacked a railing, was finally made safe. It was gratifying to see these changes, knowing that they were the result of my persistence. As I learned more about my landlord, I discovered that he owned multiple properties and was making a substantial income from his rentals. Yet, he had neglected the basic safety of his tenants. It was a clear case of profit over people, a mentality all too common in the world of rental properties. Despite the initial resentment from some roommates, as the house became safer, their attitudes began to change. They started to see the value of what I had done, some even thanked me for standing up to the landlord. It was a small vindication, but it meant a lot. The court case was another turning point. I was well prepared, armed with evidence and legal support. The landlord tried to paint me as a troublemaker, but the facts were on my side. The judge dismissed the eviction and ordered the landlord to comply with all the city's demands. The victory in court was more than just a personal triumph. It was a win for every tenant in that house. It was proof that standing up to authority, no matter how daunting, could bring about positive change. In the days following the court decision, the atmosphere in the house shifted. The landlord stopped his harassment 
and a sense of normalcy returned. It was a relief to live without the constant stress and fear of retribution. My journey in that house taught me invaluable lessons. I learned about the importance of knowing and asserting one's rights as a tenant. I realized that sometimes, taking a stand means facing opposition and isolation, but it's a price worth paying when safety and justice are at stake. I also learned the power of documentation and seeking legal help. Without the detailed report from the city inspector and the guidance of legal counsel, my case might not have been as strong. As the story of the unsafe house and the negligent landlord spread, it became a lesson for others in the community. It showed that one person's actions could make a difference. It reminded us that safety should always be a priority and landlords must be held accountable for their properties. My time in that house eventually came to an end, but I left knowing I had made it a safer place for those who would come after me. The experience stayed with me, a reminder of the strength that lies in standing up for what's right, even in the face of adversity. In a world where it's easy to feel small and powerless, this experience showed that with determination, support, and a clear sense of justice, you can fight against wrongdoing and win. It was a hard-fought battle but one that was necessary and ultimately rewarding. The unsafe house had become safe, and in doing so, it had become a symbol of what can be achieved when we refuse to accept the status quo and demand better for ourselves and our community.